We are ready to start with the post tea session. I'll request Hello. you all to One, please kindly two, three, take your four, seats as five, quickly six, as possible. Seven, eight, check, check. Namaskar, aap sabka swagat hai. Ashoka Hotel Financial Summit mein. We are going now to start with the next session which is entitled Different Institutions, Same Goal, Quest for Financial Inclusion. In this session, we shall be discussing the approaches and strategies of three different banking in institutions commercial banks, small finance bank, and a development bank in promoting financial inclusion. May I request you all once again to please kindly take your seats as quickly as possible. We are ready to start with the session. I request you all to please kindly be seated. Are different institutional types plugging different gaps in the system in terms of segments, geographies, etc so that universal inclusion can be achieved with their aggregate efforts. That is what we intend to find in this session through this discussion. So may I once again request members of the audience who are still standing to please kindly take your seats as quickly as possible. We are ready to start with our next session. Members of the audience who are still standing, may I request you all to please kindly take your seats as quickly as possible. <coughs> the esteemed moderator for this session is Dr. Rajiv Lal. He is already here in our midst, as well as the esteemed panelists. May I once again request members of the audience to kindly please take your seats as quickly as possible. Those of you who are sitting on the sides, you're requested to please shift yourselves a little towards the center. This is now from here onwards an amalgamated session. I'm sure you're all enjoying being a part of these discussions as much as we have enjoyed putting them together for you. So once again, I'll request you all to please kindly take your seats as quickly as possible. We are ready to start with the next session. Ladies and gentlemen, we promise you a power packed session. Let's get ready for some stimulating conversations and discussions. I'll request you all to please kindly take your seats. And once again, a gentle reminder to please do remember to either switch off your cell phones or put them on silent mode. This is our post tea session. And in this session, we shall talk about different institutions, same goal, quest for financial inclusion. Leading the discussion is Dr. Rajiv Lal. So very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to start the next session. Different institutions, same goal, quest for financial inclusion. We warmly welcome in our midst the esteemed moderator and the panelists of this session. I'll once again request you all to please kindly take your seats as quickly as possible. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you all the esteemed moderator for this session, Dr. Rajiv Lal. 
He is a research fellow from Singapore Management University and the Management Committee, Singapore Green Finance Center, a veteran economist and a business leader. Over his diverse career, he has straddled leadership roles both in business as well as in public policy. He was the founder MD and CEO of IDFC Bank and the executive chairman of IDFC Limited. Prior to this, he was a partner with Warburg Prince Pincus, New York, and head of Asian Economics Research with Morgan Stanley, Hong Kong, and also an economist at the World Bank, Washington, D.C., and Asian Development Bank, Manila. His expertise spans international and macroeconomics, banking, capital markets, infrastructure, finance, private equity, venture capital, and social impact investing, with a particular focus on emerging markets. It's a pleasure to have you here in our midst. May I request you to please join us on stage? We warmly welcome our esteemed speaker, Mr. Rajneesh Kumar, Chairman, MasterCard India, former Chairman, State Bank of India. A brief introduction to the honored dignitary. He completed his term as Chairman in October 2020 and is credited with steering the bank successfully through very challenging times. During his tenure, the bank developed Yono, a digital platform, which has established the bank as a global leader in the adoption of technology and innovation. Mr. Kumar is a career banker with nearly four decades of service with the State Bank of India, and his expertise is in corporate credit and project finance is well recognized. A very warm welcome to you, sir. We warmly welcome in our midst Mr. Samit Ghosh, founder of Jeevan Small Finance Bank. A brief introduction to the honored dignitary. Mr. Ghosh is the founder of the bank. He has completed his MBA from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, USA. He is a non-executive director and chairman of Ojeevan Financial Services Limited. He founded UFSL in 2014 and served as its MD and CEO until January 2017. With those brief introductions, we once again warmly welcome the esteemed speakers, the panelists of this session, and the moderator. With that, I hand it over to you, sir, to take the session forward. Hello. Um, now, now it's working, I think. Um, good afternoon to all of you. I mean, uh, we realize that now we are in the fading hours of the conference on the second day. So we will do our best to inform and entertain you. Um, um, and with that brief, um, the promise of uh, this particular um, segment or panel is to revisit the uh, question of financial inclusion from the perspective of very different um, institutions. Um, and we have uh, today um, Mr. Rajneesh Kumar, who's uh, ex-State Bank of India, so he can share with us the perspective of the giant, the banker to every Indian, on what um, their uh, experience has been uh, with financial inclusion, and more importantly, how it has changed. And I'd like to keep coming back uh, to that in various ways. And then, um, Samit, um, or Shomit, as you all <laughs> better pronounced, <laughs> um, as you know, is a veteran in the space, but the experience of a small finance bank and the challenges and prospects uh, for that um, I'd love to uncover some insight into that. Um, and for what it's worth, um, um, I'm, I'm, I, as I was telling um, the organizers, I, I think um, I would also interject uh, some of my own experience um, with uh, trying to transform IDFC and taking it in the direction of financial inclusion and all the scars that I bear for, for trying to um, uh, shepherd uh, that transition. But with that, maybe I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Kumar. Um, if you could, um, uh, financial inclusion is as old as uh, we all are, actually, um, in, in the space. So 
I would really like to, uh, for you to share with us the perspective in how the approach to financial inclusion has changed and evolved, especially over the last decade um, in India for a large bank such as State Bank of India. So first thing is uh, about the state bank. Uh, let me put it in perspective that even when it was formed, it was not formed with the objective of commercial banking. The state bank came into existence because of All India Rural Credit Survey. There was a committee. And the idea was that because we need to promote credit in the rural areas, we need a state-owned bank. And that's how a state bank got created. And uh, it has been the primary vehicle, I would say, for the government to experiment with new ideas or whatever they want to do in the banking space. Uh, it casts a certain responsibility on the State Bank of India to lead that initiative. We have been doing it, whether it was introduction of uh, SME financing in mid-60s, rural credit, I have already said that was the main objective and subsequently whatever developments have happened in the banking sector. Financial inclusion in the, I would say, in the current century, it got more focus because the number of households or the people who had bank accounts that was abysmally low in India, despite the reach of the nationalized banks and even after the economic reforms were carried out, and banking sector was open, new private sector banks came in. But access to banks, uh, it remained uh, a distant dream for more than half of the people in India. And it goes to the credit of the Reserve Bank of India, Government of India, and state-owned banks. I am being partial or rather being honest, that as far as financial inclusion is concerned, the onus has been on the state-owned banks. The real flip, I believe, came uh, around 2005 or 6, when RBI realized that you cannot solely rely on the bank branch channel. And that is when the concept of agency, you can say, or business correspondent model came in. So that was the first real big leap as far as taking the banking to the masses is concerned. And then RBI came out sometimes in 2010 or 11 with a framework, a very comprehensive paper about what the objectives of the financial inclusion are and what are the pillars on which it will. So many initiatives of RBI like BGSBD account, uh, which was a zero balance account with no fee, no transaction fee, uh, this came, simplified KYC. So, so many regulatory initiatives came. And of course, with certain targets for the bank, we had priority sector targets. So that is different, but first I am talking about uh, really what we call financial inclusion. And uh, that is how Reserve Bank has been driving it. The real, real push came in 2014. When Prime Minister on 15th August 2014, he announced launch of PM Jandhan Yojana, PM JDY. That, I believe, was a real, real paradigm shift. All the banks worked in a project mode, and within a year, uh, 35 crore Jandhan accounts were opened, uh, of which, of course, 30% share went with the State Bank of India. Again, it led that initiative. Uh, private sector bank, uh, because of their shareholders' concern, profitability concern, they probably kept away not consciously or whatever, but there was no business case for them probably to do it and incur that cost. And government in any case, they used public sector banks as a vehicle to achieve that objective. It would have not been as successful if we did not have, as I said, BC, and then what is called Jam Trinity. Jam Trinity. So general account, Aadhaar, which almost everybody had gone in starting from 2010, 11, and now everybody has Aadhaar card, and mobile. So BC and technology. That has enabled financial inclusion in the way what we see. So today, I doubt that whether there is anybody who is left out or not has a bank account or does not have access. 
and again uh, when uh, RBI uh, they they made licensing free earlier whenever you wanted to open a branch uh, you need to obtain license from Reserve Bank of India but that was done away with but it also came with certain obligations for opening a certain percentage of branches in rural and semi-urban areas and the vision was that if you are in a hilly area even if there are 500 people in a village there should be a banking outlet within five kilometers of distance. Then ATM network, which is now in excess of 200,000. So several initiatives on taking the touch points closer to the people in far-flung areas, plus uh, certain regulatory dispensations, as I said, about simplified KYC, and then the technology. So it was a combination of all these three and the other thing which has helped particularly on the payment side is NPCI which is again a last 12-13 years story. So interoperability of ATMs, interoperability of payment system, uh, availability of technology and digitization of economy, formalization of economy. So it has been a very big element and uh, where, as I said, the nationalized banks have led that initiative. Today we have more than 50 crore Jandhan accounts, uh, more than 2 trillion rupees, 2 lakh crore se zada. That much money is mobilized in these accounts. And that is where we are. And the further flip, that was on the deposit side, banking account side. But uh, with advent of my small finance bank, we are uh, Mr. Ghosh will speak, and then uh, the digital lending, which is happening in a way. So what I'm seeing is the first, it was the deposit accounts, mm -hmm. and now the real inclusion around credit with a lot of schemes from the government. And financial inclusion, one more dimension, which I would like to add is, it's not about only banking account. It is about availability of financial services. So micro insurance has also been a big factor, and two schemes, one is adult pension, Yojana, which is a pension scheme, and PM Suraksha Bhima Yojana, that is another scheme. Distribution of these products has also been given to the banks. And then you have on the credit side so many schemes, Mudra, Swanidhi, uh, which banks are doing. So I would say banks' hands are full in that sense. So you do commercial. Uh, banking where a state bank today can give a 30, 50,000 crore loan mm -hmm. and today a state bank has the capability of giving the 500 rupees loan. So that is the, I doubt whether there is any other institution in the world mm -hmm. which can do that. So, uh, so I wanted to um, ask a follow-up question before I come to Shomit. Um, uh, on the uh, business uh, evolving business model for, for State Bank of India. Um, I think from what is clear is that thanks to the Jam Trinity and thanks to um, direction from government, that inclusion in the sense of expanding access to banking services has seen revolutionary change. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, uh, but from the perspective of the economic implications of this for the bank, could you elaborate a little bit more? And I ask, and I, and I ask with two things in mind, because one impression that one carries is that the bank accounts and the two lakh crores that you are talking about um, are still from the point of view of the economics of servicing these accounts, perhaps not remunerative for, uh, for commercial banks, um, A, and, and B, that the, uh, uh, while it is evident to outside observers that banks like the small finance banks and microfinance and digital lenders um, are taking full advantage of uh, a microfinance type of lending model. Um, one is not clear, or at least I don't have line of sight, as to 
how large a business that has become for a State Bank of India. So if I were to separate uh, State Bank of India's profitability, um, has the profitability from these kinds of activities and to this segment of the client community that SBI serves, is that now become material to the overall bottom line of State Bank of India? So if you could give us some color on that. Yeah, no, I can give some color definitely because if you look at micro unit economics, so it will never be a profitable business. So the view which has to be taken, it is the aggregate. If I say I open a savings bank account with zero balance, obviously it is not profitable. Even if we take that the banking industry as a whole, which has say 2 lakh crore of deposits. So 2 lakh crore at best gives you 10,000 crore by way of spread. So these are all savings account. I am adding 5% margin. So in 10,000 crore, if you are serving say 50 crore customers, so even then the unit economics will not be working out. So there would always be an element of cross-subsidization. And uh, in a state bank, we do have business verticals. So somewhere it gets into that. And uh, one is that it is obligatory to do. Second is what I believe that when the economy is developing as a result of this so who benefits? Banks also benefit. If today's state bank makes 50, 60,000 crore of profit, then uh, it is one, its own policies and its own business model. But at the same time, the banking industry, it is benefiting out of the economic growth. And uh, uh, say, for example, the accounts, Jandhan account, they, they will all go into our casa. And the state bank has 45% casa. If a bank which has a 30% cost, so that 15% itself is a big profit pool. Uh, if, uh, uh, again, because the state bank numbers are readily available always to me even after mm -hmm. three years, if it has 15 lakh crore of savings bank, which it mobilizes at 2.70%, so that itself uh, gives it almost, almost 75,000 crore. But the cost of servicing these accounts is also huge because uh, the state bank has a staff strength of 240,000 people. You can safely say 85% of its workforce is doing only this. Services account you are maintaining, business correspondent network, ATM network, digital, mobile. What is this for? Everything is for servicing your savings account uh, customer, 48 crore of them. So there's a cost. So I think if, uh, like on unit optimist, it will never work. But it is a part of your overall business. And when out of 48 crore, uh, about 18 or 20 crore would be uh, what we call Jandhan accounts. Mm. So as a whole, uh, I think it may not be, if it is not a profit-making proposition, it is not a loss-making proposition also, considering that uh, the overall macro aggregate view for the State Bank of India. And for a state bank, there's no choice whether it is you lose money or make money. You will have to do it. So uh, in India, we have developed this model. We are, there's a model of cross-subsidization. So this is silent cross-subsidization, which is happening. But if you look at uh, the larger uh, growth in the economy, so because now with this inclusion and availability of credit, and people moving up the ladder. So what it does, it unleashes an economic force in the country and which again feeds itself. So you come, you become a part of a virtuous cycle and then as a whole you benefit. So this is my best and the most diplomatic answer to you. Thank you. No, that's very useful and I'll, I'll come back to a different aspect of that in the second round. So Shamit, uh, turning to you, um, uh, it's been how many years now since you've had the small finance bank license now? Seven years. Seven years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just in a nutshell, explain to us the, the transformation you've seen um, over the seven years and where you stand, and I'll have a follow-up question for you on that. Uh, Rajiv, before uh, we talk about 
small finance bank and our uh, this thing. Our DNA has been microfinance, as you know, and something which Radhika mentioned at the in her inaugural speech. Uh, this is the 50th year uh, since uh, Ila Ben started Seva Bank and gave a few hundred self-employed women in Ahmedabad loans, which we consider as a starting point of microfinance in India. We were doing a calculation recently uh, based on the data from NABAD and MFIN uh, as of the last financial year, 31st March 2023. I mean, uh, the total number of uh, loan accounts is 136 million. Now, if you take out duplication, etc., that means uh, between SHG and the uh, group lending programs, we are probably serving over 100 million customers today in India, you know, the mm -hmm. entire microfinance industry. And the total loan book size of the SHG and the uh, group lending uh, MFIN is 536 lakhs crores. I couldn't even convert it into dollars, you know. The thing is, uh, you know, when we started uh, microfinance, you know, a few years ago, uh, nobody, you know, talked about it. But today, we are the largest microfinance industry in the world, you know. That is something we have to be proud of, you know. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, the second thing I just wanted to recently, uh, you know, the, one of the EDs of RBI, uh, we met, uh, there was a uh, conference in IM Bangalore, and there he talked about uh, financial inclusion and the specialized institutions, not SBI, but the specialized institutions which were set up by RBI, like RRBs, LABs, and the payment banks, small finance bank, and it is the on, only specialized institution which he said, and that is, gives us a lot of pride, uh, it has been successful as a small finance bank, you know. We've, last seven years, we've lived through baptism by fire, first by demonetization when we just were born, then the COVID, etc. And, you know, now today, we still have about 12 SFBs. One is merging. Uh, so, so all of them have survived and doing well. And in terms of uh, lending, uh, you know, in the microfinance industry, there's always a tussle between MFIs and the small f uh, and the uh, universal banks. Uh, to now, re most recent is the uh, MFIs are the biggest lenders, followed by universal bank, and the third largest is the SFBs. You know, but uh, in terms of the change which has happened to us is that the uh, RBI, see, uh, as far as financial inclusion is concerned, which SBI has, you know, been initiated so many years ago, uh, uh, you have to have multiple products. You have to offer customers a wide range of products which they require. And also you have to serve multiple segments, you know. Today we are not just serving the bottom of the pyramid, we are serving sort of the aspiring population which goes into the middle class, you know. And there are different needs. And also, as far as RBI is concerned, for us, which we were a microfinance institution, where all our assets were unsecured, you know, uh, what the regulators require us that over time, that 50% of our assets get secured, you know. So then we have to actually build other businesses, secured businesses, which don't give us that kind of a return which microfinance gives, like affordable housing, MSME, a vehicle finance, etc. So we are going through that transition of building uh, these secured businesses, which don't give us that kind of a return, but it sort of stabilizes our portfolio. Now, as we were discussing, the most important part is how do we fund it, you know? Uh, as far as funding is concerned, we are competing with everyone, you know, all the banks. And uh, so uh, we've ha had to recruit people from, so our, <clears throat> the people who did microfinance lending were uh, not the right people to go and source deposits, solicit deposits, et cetera. So we had to hire a lot of people from the banking sector to build up our branch banking, et cetera, this thing. 
So there, of course, uh, there is a two, there's a culture difference between an old microfinance institution and also this, uh, the bankers who come in from the regular commercial banks, not only for the banking side, but also for MSME housing. So that is something we need to manage. So I, I had a follow-up question on that, and before that I wanted to share with you an anecdote from my own experience. So when IDFC became a bank, um, I, I knew that we had to go into deep-end retail, high-margin high retail. I understood microfinance, so that's where I took the bank. And we uh, made an acquisition of Grama Vidyal, if you recall. And it was very amusing. So I took our retail bankers and the management team. I said, you must come and see how these people do business. So we went to Trichy and Mr. Dev Raja, um, he is a very charismatic leader. So twice a day, the entire head office gathered on the third floor of their building for bhajan chanting, <coughs> right? They were very mission driven. And you should have seen the reaction of my fellow bankers. So I, after that, I said, you know, this, this cultural challenge of getting these Gucci shoes retail bankers to understand the chappal wearing culture of microfinance was really going to be challenging. How have you managed this in Ujjivan? Well, it is, it is a difficult, first of all, these, they run as separate business units. So microfinance is able to carry on whatever culture there is there in that unit, you know. And it, it is a challenge because we have to get people to come and interact between both of them and, uh, you know, understand each other, you know, that, that is the first part. But to tell you the truth, even seven years down the road, it is a continuing challenge for us, you know. We have to, but it is a continuing exercise. A new culture has to be built, you know, uh, a new, uh, uh, and the values which we, uh, the, uh, you know, with which microfinance was set up uh, has to go through some changes, etc. So that is a part of, you know, growing up and that's, how it is, but it's an ongoing exercise, you know, which goes on. Okay, uh, well, I'll come back to that, but now we're turning back to you, uh, Mr. Kumar. Um, I, I mean, I take away from your previous set of comments that although there is an implicit cross subsidy, undoubtedly the cost of that cost subsidy, uh, cross subsidy, has come down very substantially thanks to all the changes in regulation and yes. technology that you were describing. My question now is, um, how optimistic are you, or what do you think are the prospects for eventually getting to a point that we don't need to cross-subsidize this customer segment? Um, could it be that technology becomes such a powerful tool that the cost of acquiring and maintaining even a zero balance uh, savings account is such that on a segmented basis, this customer segment becomes profitable? Uh, technology also, it's cheaper, but you know there are huge investments which one has to make. And uh, for any large bank, it runs into billions of dollars. Then you have the challenges of data security and cyber security when it comes to technology. So definitely on per transaction basis, using technology, using mobile, using internet banking, it is definitely much, much cheaper. But again, segmentation is not possible. Because when bank is building system, it is one system. Then assigning cost to each segment, it is extremely difficult. So the way, and different banks are organized differently. Uh, again, the way state bank works, it has agriculture vertical, it has SME vertical, it has a housing loan vertical, it has a car loan vertical. So there is a transfer pricing mechanism on the basis of which uh, uh, the profitability of each segment is 
वर्क आउट बट साइनिंग टेक्नोलॉजी कॉस्ट बैंक हैज़ टू डू लॉट ऑफ यू नो जगलरी टू वर्क आउट दैट हाउ डू यू असाइन कॉस्ट बट एज आई सेट इट्स अगेन मे बी आई एम रिपीटिंग दैट यू हैव टू टेक ए ब्रॉडर एंड होलसम पिक्चर इन व्यू वेन इट कम्स टू मास बैंकिंग एंड द मॉडल इज दैट फॉर बैंक्स विच आर पर्टिकुलरली स्टेट ओन बैंक they have to do mass banking or retail and along with that you also do your usual stuff which is wholesale banking wealth management and uh, it's easier probably to work out the cost for those segments so the best way would be that you work out those costs and rest all is this cost as i said that For example, if a state bank did not have 48 crore customers, it would not need 240,000 people to serve it. Uh, but everything is linked because it has such a strong liability base and reach. That is where its capability to lend big that comes from there. Not every bank can do it. Uh, which bank in India? can write a check of 25000 crore 30000 crore so it is all coming it because of this intermediation which is happening uh, but uh, bc and technology both are in relative terms low cost model and uh, the when it comes to the credit side again there is a npl ratio is bit high in agriculture it is much higher even in semi loans it is higher, but uh, uh, some of the schemes government guarantee is there so that's how you partially get covered it's a very i would say very complex exercise and uh, the activity around uh, uh, financial inclusion if you the moment you try to do it from the profit lens then it will be a bit difficult but it is not that bad i would say not that bad so uh, in the state bank we were uh, taking account that how profitable our bc channel is that is possible that we know that how much cost we are incurring on bc channel and how much business they are handling and at a certain level of deposits it was able to break even to to the to ask the question somewhat differently in today's environment compared to 15 years ago is the priority sector obligation for a bank like uh, state bank of india does that require cross subsidy or it doesn't anymore no priority sector the target are only on the lending side that 40% of your book has to be in this thing and that definition also has uh, expanded over a period of time so per se sme business which is part of the project a large part of it is on the private sector so it is not a loss making proposition for the bank uh, agriculture maybe not profitable still because of high non performing loans in the agriculture sector so uh, housing loan uh, up to a certain size also are categorized at private sector so again a profitable business so Uh, this 40% obligation uh, on the whole as a whole the problem is not uh, making money out of it for the state bank of india the problem is around achieving those targets mm. and uh, the loss comes because uh, a bank like sbi because of its liability gathering machine so it gathers so much deposit every year that it cannot deploy and then it has to put money in what is called rid and uh, it used to be i don't know what is the current position so there that was a very clear loss making proposition for the bank inability to achieve the priority sector target but not the portfolio per se so i come back to this uh, some from it you had so we have a opposite problem actually <laughs> that's why you know, because uh, for us uh, if you look at it by customer segment Uh, the microfinance business is very profitable because the net interest margin uh, is very high 
And uh, when we aggregate even the cost of deposits, which we, you know, all our customers have bank accounts. Uh, when, even when we aggregate it, it's, uh, it's the most profitable business segment we have. And we are actually cross-subsidizing other businesses which are in the startup stage, which is uh, your housing, MSC, uh, in agri also, rural business. Uh, all of them are actually, I mean, few have broken even, but most of them are still underwater. And uh, it's microfinance, which is uh, sort of this segment, which is uh, supporting them, you know. The other thing you have to see is why are private sector banks acquiring microfinance institutions? That's because it's a very, not only it gives them priority sector, but it is very profitable for them, you know. So I think that is also something you need to consider. Microfinance today is uh, given, uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, we heard about, uh, you know, cost of credit of microfinance is negligible, you know, compared to other uh, uh, assets. It, it is one of the most profitable businesses you can have here. Right. So I, I detect a very strong uh, nostalgia for microfinance. I mean, you started your comments by telling us how important microfinance has been. Um, and what is clear, or if I've understood it correctly, that a standalone microfinance company is actually more profitable than, uh, on a return on equity basis than uh, a small finance bank. So do you actually, regret your when, decision? Actually, uh, when we went to do the IPO, most of the investors were telling us, Aapko kyu bank banna hai? Exactly. You know, you are making so much uh, you know, money and so profitable as an uh, NBFC. Uh, have you thought of that? But uh, you know, for us, it was very important because uh, we felt that uh, for two reasons. One is obviously uh, we wanted to be a full service provider like State Bank of India for our customers to provide full in inclusion to the customer. And secondly, also, I mean, end of the day, from a risk perspective, uh, a bank is obviously less risky compared to an NBFC, you know, because there you only have one side of the balance sheet. Here you have both, the, both, uh, both sides of your balance sheet is under your control. Uh, so uh, one question to, to both of you on this, and it has to do with, uh, um, again, technology and what it means for underwriting, right? So one of the uh, promises of uh, digital lending is that you use data to strengthen underwriting funds. Right? And what, what it means is that it opens up the possibility for doing unsecured lending at scale and much more safely than it was possible before. So. RBI, is RBI behind the curve on this? Uh, no, no, uh, yeah, frankly today RBI is quite ahead of the curve, you know, because uh, they, have <coughs> they are paying Amitabh Bachchan to promote account aggregator, you know, uh, on the TV. So you can imagine, world has changed, you know. So uh, definitely digital lending is based on truth. One is the capability to analyze them and to underwrite loans on that basis is one of it. Second is ability to control cash. And I will give you an example of say Bharat Pay, which I chair the board. So the way it works is that uh, the merchants which we acquire, we are getting daily cash. And the model is based on what we call EDI. EMI is a very familiar term. But it was EDI, easy daily installment, which is the trick in keeping your credit score below the actual line. Because uh, this is a segment where it is expected that the credit score will be good. But till such time, you are able to price that risk. But it's all right. So it is given that uh, if it is a 8% credit line, so obviously, like a bank, you can't lend at 12%. So it will be a fine. And that is where even like a finance, they are able to charge their margin and cover their credit costs. So if you 
my take is that as far as the uh, the underwriting institutions margin is concerned it will remain as it is if because of superior digital or analytics based underwriting the credit cost comes down it will go to the borrower so <laughs> nobody finances the loss the borrower community themselves finance the loss if the credit and it is very obvious if it is a housing loan you can get today at 8 and a half percent unsecured lending i don't think you can get anywhere less than 25 to 30 percent so we bear the cost it is the borrower community which bears the cost it is ultimately the security credit quality function but uh, as i said that uh, in any lending if the lender has control over the cost structure then based on avoiding adverse selection So, if you control these two, you can keep your credit costs under control. No, <coughs> the, uh, obviously, cost of uh, credit is, you know, uh, going to be very beneficial using analytics, etc. <coughs> But uh, the other thing is, you know, the customers themselves are getting even microfinance customers are getting demanding, you know, over time in terms of service, and uh, fairly significant overlap. Uh, is there today uh, between microfinance customers and people borrowing from people like Bajaj, and Bajaj can give you a loan as soon as you walk into a store. So the expectation level is there. That why you know why can't you do that for me? You know, so uh, service level expectations of customers are also uh, escalating. You know, I mean, and for that technology is definitely required, and. end of the day you know i mean whole the way we started microfinance uh, in a viable in a profitable uh, this thing was using technology you know to reduce the operating costs you know otherwise this business would have never been viable you know so uh, from a cost all the cost perspectives operating credit and from a service perspective continuous improvement of technology is very important so to to this question what i what i was actually trying to get at is the following do you in your judgment do you think that a business model for retail banking institute uh, can actually be built on unsecured lending by retail banking and that's that's where digital lending that's a logical business model isn't it and is that a reachable prospect and what do we need to do to 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 build confidence in that even with the regulation so uh, i mean if you see today rajesh today the most advanced in terms of retail lending is bajaj finance right and they are way ahead in terms of analytics and everything so that shows you the way that's the direction you have to go and that is also the customer's expectation but this uh, unsecured lending definitely uh, about particularly about when we talk about the small percentages uh, what i think that apart from the risk building in the balance sheet our biggest concern is also around the collection uh, there have been news by points and including a bbc documentary that uh, many digital lending applications what kind of excesses they are committing when it comes to recovery and collection so that is uh, again would be an area of regulatory concern so it is both but uh, regulator again they have to perform the function of keeping that financial system doesn't suffer or any risk build up like it built up in corporate lending book so there would always be a fear that what next so you have fixed one problem and then after 5 years you enter into another so and for the lending institution also it is a good idea to have a diversified portfolio but uh, digital lending uh, in secure lending it gets limited when uh, because lot of documentation happens and the ecosystem also is not uh, completely digitized that uh, secured lending can happen quickly Uh, without manual intervention that is the position as well that it is not that it has to be like that for ever uh, as the uh, investment in technology and the ecosystem like say suppose you want to do a property fund 
way unless the property records are digitized there will be delay in getting a title certificate etc so you can't disburse the loan in 5 minutes unsecured loan you can disburse in 5 minutes okay so there is a cost benefit analysis and uh, a caution from regulator it is always expected but uh, i always believe that this is also a segment where we were always complaining that institutional finance is not available to them they are in the clutches of money lenders right if the formalization is happening and institutional lending is happening then where to strike the balance one is that you can't move people from set of one clutch of money lenders to another set of money lenders but unsecured finances i come from ut i know how it happens give me 1000 rupees after one month take back 2000 rupees so that is the <laughs> now you calculate what is the ir so you are filling a need so i think uh, some caution for sure risk based pricing you must be able to uh, underwrite that risk and then credit cost if it is high you should be able to recover that so yeah you had to no i mean uh, see as far as i am concerned if you have a good underwriting and basically the loans get repaid from cash flow and security as far as my experience is is it is a security blanket of a baby you know Secu uh, secured unsecured is uh, i mean if you underwrite well and you can collect and if there is good cash flow of the uh, you you evaluated the cash flow then it's a good loan and you have to have diversified business to me uh, this secured unsecured doesn't make sense at all you know uh, and we've yeah. seen a uh, lot of secured loan businesses had such high credit costs you know okay, so i had wanted to generate that debate so <laughs> i have <laughs> succeeded so anyway we we have a few minutes left uh, we would like to open up uh, the discussion to the floor so if anybody has any question Uh, please identify yourself and uh, there will be somebody with a mic difficult to see you know i see you ready to go to the mic so nobody has any any question so i think we have been very informative <laughs> <laughs> on that basis i i just have one concluding question to close the session I think what I have taken away from today's uh, conversation is that technology has been uh, a huge facilitator for all business models, um, and these business models are evolving um, with different approach to security and to client segmentation, uh, etc. But one of the challenges on the road to financial inclusion that still remains is actually getting to fill the bottom of the pyramid and here particularly those that are in rural india and directly or indirectly associated with agriculture and processing are very volatile that's a segment that we still have some work to do to integrate into mainstream so my final question to both of you is what are your thoughts about how we should get there and what are the prospects that we will get there i think in the last 10 years we made so much progress um can we be optimistic that we'll get there to the bottom of the pyramid over the next decade so as far as agriculture financing is concerned uh, i think even there lot is happening what we call agritech and many fintechs have come in who are doing agriculture and the post production financing is much easier and much safer the problem is arising all because of crop issues because there is so much uncertainty and unfortunately even crop insurance it has come into crop insurance is not there and one requirement uh, which regulators in their wisdom they have uh, put this requirement that when the crop is mature and you pay the full balance of crop which according to me is leading to lot of on a credit card there is no such requirement you just pay minimum balance and you are all right in your typical cash credit account for the industry 
there is no such requirement that you pay the entire rent. But in case of agriculture, this is a condition. And uh, in my view, the whole crop loan scheme, that makes a fresh look. Lending, uh, the, the, the theory is again, it is arising of that security-based approach. The crop is the security. That is what we believe, and we are lending against the crop. But that is not the reality. The lending in the rural sector has to be income-based, not treating crop as an asset. What is the household income? And then what is the serviceability of that loan? You can't give a short-term crop loan. The, uh, the agriculture indebtedness and bad loans, in my view, this is a creation of the faulty crop loan. You might know what to say. It needs a thought on this. Thank you for that. I feel, uh, you know, uh, with all the changes which have happened in the last few years, uh, with the SSBs and for-profit uh, MFIs, et cetera, all, uh, the bottom 5 to 10 percent of our population, which are tribals and others, frankly uh, have, you know, been, continues to be ignored, you know. And uh, there, uh, you know, there used to be specialized NGO type uh, MFIs would uh, we had special interest in that those groups. I think something of that nature is required because the uh, the MFIs, most MFIs have moved, you know, to the for-profit or uh, become SFBs. We are more worried about doing MSC loans and uh, affordable housing or vehicle finance than that real bottom of the pyramid. I think specialized institutions are required for that and which requires some kind of support, you know. Thank you. Um, so just uh, by way of conclusion, first of all, thank you very much. A round of applause for our, our participants. I just hope that uh, our optimism carries uh, on and then we will be meeting for more and more of these uh, sessions. Next year, Vipin, we look forward to yet another improved session on financial inclusion. Thank you all very much. We thank our esteemed panelists and the moderator of this session. Thank you for making it a very animated and lively discussion. A special thanks to the esteemed moderator, Dr. Lal. Thank you for taking out the time to moderate the session. We do have a small memento as a token of our appreciation and thanks.